Hello everyone, welcome back to the Market Chat. My name is Richard Moglin, and joining us today as our special guest is Ross Haber, who is a former William & Neal & Company portfolio manager, a former hedge fund manager helping oversee $700 million, and he is also the founder, head trader, and partner over at TraderLion, which aims to teach the next generation of traders how to think for themselves in the stock market, not just how to follow. Ross, thanks so much for being here, and welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Richard. Perfect. So why don't we get started, because I do want to cover a lot today. Um, so let's start with your background. So the first question I always ask is, how do you get started with trading, and what were some key learning moments? Well, it, to be quite honest with you, it all started when I graduated um, from, from college, uh, end of 94, beginning of 95, a friend of mine said he was doing well uh, as a retail broker at all these discount stock brokers. I'll put the name out there. They've been taken over by H&R Block since, but that was the big discount firm um, competing against Charles Schwab at the time before online brokerage became what it is today. So I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, the first book they gave me to read there, even before the Series 7, was How to Make Money in Stocks by William O'Neill. Um, so that, there was about 65, 75, 65 to 70 guys in that office. Um, they all followed the canceling methodology at the end of every day. There was a spreadsheet updated the whole nine yards. Um, I journeyed from there to another retail brokerage where I uh, became the sales manager and became very friendly with one of my clients who was also a big can slim William O'Neill fan. So what any anyway, long story, one thing led to another. She um, introduced me to uh, Gil Morales, who at the time, I was one of her retail brokers at that time. People would often trade with a couple of, you know, maybe a full service, which Gil was at that time. He was working with Payne Weber. He was a full service broker. So not only did, you know, so big commission for the full service research at the time, whereas Oldie was commission free if you had XYZ in your account and traded so many shares. So he was hired by William O'Neill and our mutual client called me one day and said, How'd you like to go out to California and work for William O'Neill? I thought she was joking. And, uh, you know, she had explained to me, she, she had talked to Gil about me and vice versa. And so she had me give him a jingle on it. You know, thanks to Gil Morales, it, it all took off from there. He hired me to, uh, to start it. So yeah, at 19, beginning of 1998, I started at institutional sales, institutional services, whatever you want to call it out in LA. That's when I left and uh, headed out for, you know, institutional land. Said. Um, so from there, uh, maybe I think it was less than a year um, in institutional sales. I was doing very well on my personal account. I had uh, developed several relationships in the industry with fund managers, what have you. Um, uh, one of my clients who I became very close with, we were doing very well together, um, gave me an offer I couldn't refuse to come run his hedge fund with him. So. Mm -hmm. When I came in to resign, I honestly expected to be walked out by my arm by the head of compliance and figured they'd send me what they wanted, you know, from my office. Instead, Gil uh, called Bill and Bill came in, took me into the institutional services conference room and sat me down and offered me a position to stay and manage money for the firm. So, wow. That's something I couldn't say no to. And fortunately, you know, my, again, my buddy at the time who I, who's my buddy now, who I was going to work with, you know, he, he wouldn't have let me say no to that. He actually, uh, at that point, I think I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking, he actually, um, when I had a visit at this point, I hadn't signed a lease yet, but all of my stuff had already been moved from California to Florida in Boca Raton. It was sitting in a truck and he paid one of his buddies to hop back in that truck and bring it back to me so I could stay. So, and then, uh, you know, I working at O'Neill, I don't know how much you want me to go into that was uh, experience of a lifetime. Um, so, and that is what led me into hedge fund land. So I don't need to give you the whole story. I don't Neil, I, you know, I think you know, everyone can read that. I, I ran money for the firm. I, you know, the, built one of the model books, the proprietary model books with Mike Webster and Charles Harris. I did the workshops and, you know, that led me to, um, a job with a gentleman named David Fellman. He was looking for an O'Neill portfolio manager. He started by talking to Gil, who mm -hmm. um, introduced him to me. And lo and you know, one thing led to another. I found myself sitting in 
in New York City running some money with uh, with this gentleman who was the mid cap. He used to manage the mid cap growth fund for Fidelity. He did that for seven years. Very successful. He was a Jeff Binnick protege. I don't know if you're familiar with Jeff Binnick. He used to run the Fidelity Magellan Fund. He was mm -hmm. a in back then. So. Um, we mixed the, I guess you could say the Vinick fundamentals with the uh, O'Neill technicals. David had a, a, David, my partner had a big respect. He actually worked with Gil. I think he, um, you know, paid a, an extra advisory fee to institutional services, if you will, to have access to Gil. And mm -hmm. so the combination worked well. So everything that we had the most conviction in, you know, him fundamentally, me technically, we made our biggest positions and it, it worked extremely well. Now, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. A solid uptrend in a cooperative market always is helpful. For sure, for sure. And tell me a little bit more about what working for Bill was and working with him. So uh, what would a meeting with him be like and what would you guys talk about? And yeah, kind of throughout the week, how many times were you guys talk back and forth about different stocks and all that? Well, I'll tell you, you know, Bill not only was the, the, you know, the king of the market, he's a natural born salesman too so in institutional sales it, we it, listen it was great to, to listen to his stories the relationships he built with the you know the big guys that are out there but honestly even in institutional sales if i'm not mistaken we used to meet with him three times a week for about an hour you know before the market opened and we would go through all of his thoughts on the market what he thought you know um we had access to in institutional services we provide uh a buy and a sell list, if, you know, for all intents and purposes. So we would go through all of those, which stocks were doing what the road to, you know, all of, uh, I would tell you that I guess I try to make my newsletter a many, many, many version of, you know, what we'd go through with, the, you know, here's the distribution town. Here's what I think about the general market, whether it's tired or strong or what have mm -hmm. you rotation in the market, what's leading the market, what, you know, maybe, we, for example, we've seen software leading the market for a while. Maybe we would, we'd go through and break it down into industry group from security software stocks to, what is it, application software to whatever it is. And, you know, maybe we would notice that, uh, you know, I always try to look at everything in life cycles, you know, uh, once stocks get later um, in their run and become more obvious, hence those late stage or third and fourth stage basis tend, you know, tend to fail. Um, I lost my train of thought. Can you guide me back there? Richard? Yeah, of course. So you were just telling me kind of what it was like working at William O'Neill and, and talking with Bill every day and, oh, and yes. how he would teach you and mentor you as well. Yeah, so it, it was great. So we, to listen, first of all, I think the huge benefit was getting to listen to him repeat himself, you know, about the mm. same thing. And, and to get to, Eventually, you hear it, you, and then one day, so many things just click and stick. The simplest things that maybe you've heard, and finally, the 174th time that, thankfully, he was going over the same. I mean, he literally, he went over the same thing. You know, it wasn't the same thing. It was according to the market that day, but he really was in there. He spent the time with us to go over the market in depth um, as a portfolio manager now, it, you know, which it fortunately... Uh, you know, I had unlimited access to Bill at that point. The portfolio managers are creating, are you know, adding and subtracting the the names from the buy and sell list there, all of that sort of thing. So we're in constantly um, talking to Bill. We're on the, you know, we've basically got his number at home, and as long as he's not sleeping, we're you know, he'll hop on the phone with you to chit chat about the market or baseball. That's that's a great opportunity. <laughs> what team did he follow? On? I don't I don't know that actually. Oh, you know, I'm I'm good. I'm going to tell you, I completely forget where, what, what he was a big fan of, but his favorite analogies of all, you know, if, I don't know how many workshops you've, or maybe you watch something in, you know, from the past now, his, his favorite analogies are baseball. I'm terrible. I should know that. I should know his favorite team, but I don't, I don't remember. And the baseball analogies work so well, honestly, you, you only have to win 30% of the time and you can do amazing. You can be a hall of famer trader. So it works well. Absolutely. Money ball. <laughs> mm -hmm. So actually tell me about those workshops because you led them for a number of years. So what was that experience kind of passing on that can some knowledge and all the experience from you, from Bill and trying to teach an audience about the process? You know, 
it was probably one of the most valuable things I would say in the beginning that I was forced to do. And it's not that I didn't want to do it. I didn't want, the reason I continue to do a newsletter is I want, listen, Bill was the ultimate teacher. And I think it, it's one thing to learn it for yourself and selfishly, I don't know if it's selfish, but it's not to just sit in the corner and do it yourself. And I watched what he did. I mean, he went way out of his way to run investors business daily. And I say this nicely out of loss. I don't, I don't know that it ever did better than break even, although I haven't been there in a while. Maybe, maybe it has, but let, I'll tell you this, that has not been um, a super profitable uh, project for them. However, it's how many people has that helped um, learn the process and become independent independently wealthy it's amazing um teaching those people and watching them come back workshop after the workshop i i remember people specifically um uh, two ladies in particular that uh you know they were managing their you know the house moms managing their husband's money at home and uh they turned into the breadwinners after a couple of years it's a it's amazing what you can do you know when you if you really like it and you spend the time with it you can get your ego out of it and stay positive and follow those rules like you said you can be right 30 percent of the time and still make a fortune it's all about keeping your ego uh out of it don't worry about being wrong because you're gonna be wrong a lot and uh just get get good at being wrong fast yeah so it's that psychology and that actually kind of brings me to we talked a little bit earlier about what books helped you so outside of how to make money in stocks what books kind of helped your process, helped you learn about the psychology of trading? And yeah, what kind of compliments can Slim? My, I'm, my favorite of, uh, of, of all the psychology, book, psychology books out there is um, Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. I keep, I'm a huge fan of Audible. I use it more than uh, Netflix, but I guess that's what happens when, you, when you're over 40, you listen to books instead of watching movies. But anyway, that is one book that I will turn on and it, I can't tell you how many times I've just turned it on from the beginning and listened to that very beginning over and over again. And it's, it's like I'm hearing, I get something new out of it every time. But lately, you know, I'll, you, you can just pick a spot anywhere in that book, whether you want to open up and read it or just throw it on for seven minutes while you're sitting and listening. And it's enlightening. There's, I, I don't think there's any, any chapter, any part of that book that isn't, that isn't helpful. Um, you know, staying positive. You know, when I lived out in California, I, um, I I will tell you the staying healthy yoga thing and watching after yourself. There's something to that. I always do the best when I'm taking care of myself and you know, spending a little time to make sure I'm healthy, well slept, and all of that sort of thing. Um, but you know, psych. So obviously all of that stuff, you know, things at home that, that all affects you, but trading psychology wise, I mean, there's just so many nuggets in there. I mean, one of the ones that I can't hear enough is, you know, how it, you get beat up maybe once or twice and you know, that forget, even if you haven't lost a lot of money, sometimes that'll just really hurt your psyche. And once your psyche is hurt, Oh, it, it, there's there, you, you've got it. So anyway, you've, you've got to get out of that funk, but what, you know, Mark Douglas said, um, if my guess is you've probably read it, reminds you is that trade, that instance that has nothing, zero correlation to do with your very next trade. The only mm -hmm. reason you will continue to make terrible trades from that point forward is if, you know, you've let yourself get negative and you get in that rut. But that had, you know, um, so that sort of thing to know and to hear and the background with it and everything. And I mean, that is one small thing that is, um, you know, and that goes right along with, uh, you know, cutting your losses. It, it's all, listen, I will tell you this, as far as is the market okay, is this pull, but what I'll always tell you is this, um, I'll, distribution count used to work like magic and now it just doesn't. However, um, I think, you know, when we were discussing before, distribution, distribution, the big institutions, they try and get rid of stock if they can on the way up. So one thing that I'm always, you know, looking for, and this is, it, it'll become obvious just with experiences when the market seems to be magically floating up, floating up, but all your stocks are getting hammered. That, mm. and then all this, and you, maybe you're up enough to give it a little, um, to give it a little time. You know, time. Uh, there comes that point where, uh, for example, today everything's getting hammered, and then the market starts to follow. I opened up at high. You know, I've been. 
ticking back and forth in and around my all time highs. So I'll get to a point where I don't care what stock I had at what point I've got my line in the sand where I'll just start over, even if it means my hundred and plus percent or positions that I really didn't want to. So, um, or, you know, I, you know, uh, something that I've been working on and it hasn't really been a thing that I've been working on with Ray, who I work with at trader line. He's, uh, he's brilliant at hedging and, and working these indexes. So for once, I've, uh, I think I was just talking to you about this. I put, I hedged myself with some S triple Qs and, uh, you know, I actually um, did some proactive selling over the last couple of days. So I was way off. I wasn't even fully invested on a cash basis coming in today. So I could have done the S triple Qs a little better, but Hey, you know, uh, that, that's something I'm just learning. Um, Still learning. That's great uh, to hear. And I, uh, uh, constantly learning. Let me tell you something. I, I constantly, and I, and I'm sure, you know, I think we're going to, we'll get to this, but when not only do I go back and look at trades to see what I did wrong so that I don't do it again, I go back and look at where am I making money? Where am I not making money? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you where I was not making money. I was not making money trading ETFs. I was not making money trading options. I was not making money trading the market. So I, I was not making money trying to hedge myself. I could magically lose money on both. Mm -hmm. So I just, I try to proactively sell and work my way towards light exposure, if not cash, if I have to. Today is the first time in as long as I can remember that I, I just straight up followed Ray with something that wasn't too crazy. And hey, it was, it put, it was enough to put a smile on my face to, to watch it float my account while I you know, got rid of my lungs calmly instead of in a hurry while it was all you know, falling apart. So, so that's yeah, like, I can't tell yeah. you how much I learned from that guy every day. He's amazing. Yeah. You know? And that really brings it back to the psychology because you were hedging and, and following your system, you were more centered, you can make more education based choices. And that's so important, isn't it? I can sit at my desk calmly now, even if I don't have the hedge on and I understand that as long as I stay positive and cut my losses, I have my line in the sand and I follow it. I know it'll take me two decent days to, to make back what I lost and then some. However, if I get really negative and let my, you know, head get the wrong way it'll be very easy to con you know to continue down the rabbit hole so and i've For learned sure. listen, I, when i was young i had a hard time not getting upset at my desk now <laughs> fortunately i sat with a guy who got i won't i won't name him but before i shared an office at william o'neill and company with mike webster i shared it with another portfolio manager who wound up leaving on his own to another firm really good guy but he was no joke six four maybe 260 and built and he would get super angry and he'd t pick up the keyboard and like tomahawk it, you know, Oof. like, like karate chop it. So I can't, at least three times I got pelted in the face, in the head, in the back of the neck with, with keyboard keys. He went through them. So Oof. I never got, I never got that violent, but I mean, you know, I used to get up, you know, it would take me several days to get out of my funk in whatever. And I'm not going to say that I, that never happens. It's very easy to get into a funk depending on what's going on, but I've, over time, I've learned how to uh, manage that. To spot it and manage that. Yeah, much much better now. It's funny. I still, you know, I I can still get better at it, but it's noticeably better than it was twenty years ago. That's for sure. It's not easy. For sure. It's not easy sitting there and controlling yourself when your hard earned money is disappearing in a hurry. And I have a terrible habit of being fully margined in a few stocks. So one hundred percent. And could you name like three other trading books that kind of complement? How to make money in stocks? Uh, reminiscences of a stock operator. I know everyone talks about it to me. I, I've got that one on Audible. I'll continue to listen to it just because there's so much. It's one of those things like has nothing to do with trading the alchemist. I don't know if you've read it by Paulo Coelho. I think his name is a Brazilian author. But it's, I don't uh, write that down. Deeply. One of it's got some deep spiritual lessons, but it's like a nice light story. So I like, I like the reminiscences because I'm a you know, obviously a stock market junkie. So it's a great story and so much to be learned by that. So I, I personally, I, I like Darvis a lot. That was actually the first one that kind of led me into the system and, and you can read it in an afternoon. So that's one of my favorites. Okay, um, let's, let, let's see. I've got, I've got a bookshelf over here. Um, Mine are very, but yeah, that's required by the way. Yes. Darvis is required reading at O'Neill. Yeah. So that's how I made $2 million. Yeah. I, I think that's a, that's a must read. And it sounded like you were about to stay. Stan, Stan Weinstein. And if you like him, I, I actually have a good relationship with him. I went to high school with his daughter. And so hmm. when I also, I was a, he uh, took it when I, 
when I was running the fund in New York, I was a client of his just because, because it was great to talk to him and get his perspective. But believe me, he's extremely different than what we do. I'll, I, I can show you some old reports and you will see it's, it, it, I have a ton of respect for it, but it's, um, it, it isn't, it, it does not jive with O'Neill, that I can tell you. Mm -hmm. In some respects it does, but in, in many cases it doesn't. If the, I showed you the stocks he was looking at in general, you'd be like, no. <laughs> and he, it's just different stuff. He just looks at a lot of over, you know, the, the stuff that's deeply oversold. He, he's buying those bases off the bottom and mm -hmm. he's real good at it. Really mm -hmm. good. So, um, he was picking up his daughter in the Aston Martin when we were in high school. So he's got it figured out. For sure. And <laughs> you almost mentioned there. So is there a standard list that portfolio managers have to read when they come to an O'Neill of, of books? I would, yeah, you know, I'm sure that list ha has probably grown and, and changed a bit, but I'm sure um, I could call one or two of our favorite portfolio managers there and uh, get, get that list. But yeah, it was def reminiscences, obviously Bill's book, um, Stan's book wasn't on there, but the Darvis was on there. I have to go through, I have, I have it all jammed away, put away. I love a lot. I mean, I love the uh, Jesse Livermore books, period. Mm -hmm. So um, the, um, just me personally, you know, one of the books that was, there's several of them you can get. Like the, I enjoyed reading and learned The Amazing Life of Jesse Livermore, World's Greatest Stock Trader. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've got one. I really like that. Um, that's, a good, that's a good place to start for new traders, I think, all, all of those books. And and uh, we'll, we'll post it on Twitter when, if you can find that list or remember. Fair enough, more fair names. enough. Fair enough. I, I know it's one of those things where I know I've got another half a dozen books that should be rolling off the tip of my tongue and I'm stuck. So I owe yeah. you that. No, all good. Um, so let's see. The last thing I want to ask you about William and & Neal and Company is what were some key lessons that you learned from Bill and, and working there? I would say uh, the biggest two takeaways and I, you know, again, I told it's such a simple thing and I can't, I can't stress it enough. It's what I stress in, in uh, you know, the little newsletter that I write in, in that would watch the leaders. I honest, getting a feel for and understanding the health and breadth of the leadership, understanding what healthy rotation looks like, understanding um, what leadership looks like, how many, how healthy leadership looks at what stages of the market. So obviously that uh, it comes with experience help. So I, you know, it's a lot. So when I see the deep, the deep sell-offs, uh, you can't tell much in a day or in a, in a day or two, but I'm constantly watching rotation. I'm like, um, so uh, I haven't gone through yet today. I walked away from my screen the last couple hours of the day, just because I could. Um, so I haven't gone. So what I'll do now is when I go through the stocks today, I want to see how bad the damage is to which groups. I want to see, you know, if is rotation, what do, what do we see uh, the rotation and in going into? Is it the super defensive, you know, flight, you know, flight to safety type trades, or does it look like we're moving out of some of these extended tech names and in, either into another area of technology or medical equipment or biotech or the something that, that, that is related with leading a bull market. It can't be you know, prepared foods and the utilities and those sort of things. It, it, it can be even retail, the restaurants, something with big earnings that I know can hold up the market while we see if the rest of the stuff either heals or ultimately drags everything down. But mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off, but to me, no, but getting a feel for, for, for that, the health, the quality of rotation, how it's going on, how many, sto do, how many stocks does it look like um, could fall apart or ultimately be, you know, does it look like we're going to have more, you know, am I going to have more stocks to uh, put on my report in the next few days to talk about that are um, high quality setups that I have an eye on or all of a sudden am I going, wow, there's nothing to buy. That's mm -hmm. usually a big sign that something's wrong. When there's, you can't find a single stock you like, or you can find a handful and everything just looks terrible. Yeah, it's pretty, unless you you know, got a core position in something that you've been holding and you just want to hang on. And that's absolutely fine. That's how you make the big money. Um, otherwise, yeah, that, that is, so that's what I, you know, and I listening to that over and over, I, whether I heard it from Bill O'Neill or the other PMs there, Chris Ketcher was one who, who really put that in my brain. Um, follow the leaders, watch, you know, the health and breadth of the leaders. And then the other thing um, is going back and, 
So what I always tell people is you want, you want to have a, listen, I always tell you this, you know, there's a lot of people out there who will tell you can slim doesn't work. And I'll tell you, if you think can slim doesn't work, you're doing it wrong. It works. You know, so I'll tell you that it, is it super easy? No, but it's doable. Um, Bill would tell you, you know, your average trader can do it in two or three years, but it works. It's proven. Bill's done the work. Nothing needs to be changed. However, now, mind you, remember Bill, you know, the, he's the guy who wrote the book. Does he really need six or seven other people over there managing money for the firm? Probably not. However, he, he finds value in that. And not only this, so he's got seven people all trading using the methodology that he wrote a book about. Everyone's looking at the same list of stocks over there, yet you'd be surprised how different the perspective is. And mm -hmm. what happens ultimately is once you've got that methodology, everyone's, you know, learns a little bit differently, their risk tolerance is a little bit, whatever it is, they, you see things differently. I can't say, so um, going back and looking at what you've done wrong, what you've done right, um, really, and, and understanding what that is and then creating rules personal to you, obviously within mm. the, the guidelines of, of what Bill has already done, you wanna, you're not making different rules that would open you up to more risk, what you're doing, if, and if anything, is to protect yourself more, you know, the ultimate would be lowest risk, highest reward possible, right? So that's where I, what I'm always looking for or talking about in terms of optimal entry. So what personalizes, you know, a methodology that there's a book, you know, so that's what it is, is really um, maybe even making a model, because I'll tell you, you know, I don't, th I think I, uh, I digress back when we were talking about doing the workshops in the model, listen, making that model book, it, it, it's tedious work doing the workshops in the beginning. I didn't mind. I liked teaching. I want to teach, but putting me on stage, I think I, 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 sh I shook pretty badly. Public, public speaking is not, not my forte, but um, I continue to do it because I think, you know, me continuing to teach as many people as I can at this point is, it has to be done. That's just, you know, so I enjoy, I enjoy it. I, um, that's what I, if the newsletter started off as me sharing homework with my friends and it just kind of blossomed into the newsletter. And I guess, well, you may even ask me about this and, you know, I'll thought we can at your leisure, you know, but that's how I, you know, and eventually I met Ray and that's what blossomed into uh, trader line. But those, honestly, those are the two big things. Watch the leaders that, you know, the health and breadth of the leadership, you know, mm -hmm. get, it, get it. So that crazy, um, the way I keep track of alerts, the way I'm constantly resetting alerts, resetting alerts all day long. Um, that's how I, in my, I probably keep way too many alerts set. Um, and I know I'm all over the place here, but um, it, while we're talking about it, the way that I use the alerts, and I, I guess it kind of relates back is, let's say I keep a hundred, which is too many, and I probably keep more than that. But of those hundred stocks, I'm keeping track of what I consider to be the the leaders of of the important leading groups, mm -hmm. and so I have alerts set on actual pivot points. But then I've also got my early alerts, which I'm constantly setting and resetting. I want to see on the way to an actual pivot. Maybe I can sneak in early. What would make me sneak in early? Well, the first thing, and the first thing always, the first cue would be if I look and I see that you know uh, we've been it's first two hours of the market have passed and volume still trading 148% more than average. A stock's approaching a pivot. There's not a whole lot of resistance. It's cranking volume. The group is good. The market's smooth. You can bet your butt uh, I'm going to buy as much as I can before it breaks out if I can catch it doing. So that's why that's one benefit of doing that. The other benefit is when I've got, you know, I know my 10 software stocks, my 10 um, biotechs, my 10, retail, you know, specialty retails, whatever it is, when I'm constantly resetting all day, <clears throat> the, the beautiful part about MarketSmith is in that you can sort it and see where everything is relative to itself, to one another. It's really, so that I've been doing that. I developed that process in Wanda. The Wanda, the Wanda alert system and box looks almost identical. It works just the same unless they, unless they've changed it recently. I canceled Wanda several years ago. I, I'd imagine not too, too much has changed. So, um, I've been, I've been doing, I've literally been doing that since 98. It just works for me. So though, you know, that was it to go all the way back. That's how I keep track. That's how I keep track of it. And if you'd like, we can, I know we're going to do some screen sharing. I'll show you exactly how, what that looks like. Um, uh, but those are your yeah. two big ones.
make your own rules, personalize, you know, take Bill's system, make it your own. How do you make it your own? You got to go back, look and see where you're making money, where you're not making money. I stick to trading the gross stocks. Everything else seems to be uh, eh, at best. Um, and, you know, health and then the health and breadth of the leaders and the distribution and the market whipping all over the place is secondary. I have seen the distribution clusters of eight or nine days and the breadth way skinnier than it is now and the market be fine. So, I mean, even when I see the distribution pile up, as long as it doesn't look like we're, you know, bailing out of all leading stocks across the board and, you know, I'm usually not too worried about it. Hi everyone, that was part one of Ross's interview. In part two, we focus more on the technicals, talking about pocket pivots, signs of accumulation, screens and market smith. And we also go over the top 10 report of 2019, talking about Shopify, Coupa Software, ARWR. And Ross talks through the charts, goes through where he bought, where he sold and why. Um, so it's definitely very interesting. So go ahead and check that out. It should be right over there. Um, and make sure you guys leave a like down below on this video and subscribe if you're new to the channel. And I'll see you guys in part two.